Jim Carrey in his latest movie, The Truman Show. And in just a few years, Jim Carrey has become one of the biggest stars on the planet and certainly the biggest comedy star in the movies today. And to his credit, he has regularly tested his audience with adventurous projects such as The Truman Show, which is why we're calling this special edition of Siskel and Ebert Jim Carrey Class Clown. <laughs> or should it be Classy Clown? I'm Gene Siskel of the Chicago Tribune. And I'm Roger Ebert of the Chicago Sun-Times. Now, viewers of our show may find it odd that Gene and I are devoting a half an hour to Jim Carrey because neither of us was swept away at all by his first starring role back in 1994 as Ace Ventura Pet Detective. His rubber-faced, elastic physical performance reminded many of a young Jerry Lewis, but it sure did leave us cold. Here's a sample from our 1994 review. Ace Ventura Pet Detective, shockingly bad. You know, uh, I'm kind of grateful for this film because... Uh, Occasionally, people say, have you What's seen any really bad movies lately? What's the worst? You know, you're trying to, you know, you might have several candidates, and you <laughs> can't right. decide among them, and now I've got one I won't have to think about. I can just say Ace Ventura, Pet Detective. We didn't predict and, much uh, of a future for this guy. When I, I talked with Kerry about his career recently, thing, he remembered those thumbs I down. Know, but I, I really like to look at life as the negatives are, are things to learn from or things to, to tell you it's not all going to be roses. It's like, that's how I looked at it. I went, well, you know, I hope the movie does good, but, you know, wow. You know, I, different, a lot of people aren't going to like it. I guess that what has happened to me with Jim Carrey over the last uh, four years is a learning experience in which I got onto his wavelength or began to understand and appreciate a little more what he was doing, which wasn't obvious to me at the beginning, and movie by movie, it became more clear to me. Well, I have given, get this, a positive review to every single one of his movies, except the Ace Ventura pictures. Out of that character, I like him. You even like Cable Guy. I only yes. gave two thumbs up to Jim Carrey so far, but on the other hand, my appreciation has been on a steadily upward climb. Okay. Box office numbers are often suspect, but there is only one conclusion from the financial results of Jim Carrey's movies. Audiences are buying what he's selling. Ace Ventura, $72 million. The sequel, Ace Ventura, When Nature Calls. 50% bigger at 108 million. Dumb and Dumber, 127 million. The Mask, 119 million. The Cable Guy, his one supposed flop, which wasn't, 60 million dollar gross. And Liar Liar, 181 million dollars at the North American box office. If you add in the international figures, these six movies have grossed worldwide a staggering 1 billion 160 million dollars. I think only Tom Cruise or maybe Harrison Ford in this era has been that consistently successful. An amazing track record. They say all comedians have serious actors inside of them trying to get out. Jim Carrey tried a more serious role in The Cable Guy in 1996, and it was his lowest grossing picture, even though it did make, as Gene says, $60 million. Audiences didn't embrace it like they did the others. Now they get another chance to sample a non-traditional Carrey role in The Truman Show, an ambitious fantasy directed by Peter Weir about a man who doesn't know that his entire life and everything and everyone in it is part of a television show. He's heading west on Stewart. Stand by all extras. Gloria, he'll be on you in about 90 seconds. Props, make sure the coffee's hot. Okay, he's making his turn on the Lancaster Square. At a time when celebrities like Carrie himself seem to live inside media fishbowls, this is a thoughtful, entertaining, challenging movie about the way the rest of us live right along with them vicariously. Oh, there's no question. Uh, this picture is saying that television is this great yawning maw that must be fed. Mm -hmm. And so, what's fed to it in The Truman Show? 
Truman, Truman from his yeah. life, his when whole I, life, when I was every talking, part of it. When I was talking to Kerry, I said, is it going to be like this in the future? He says, it's like this now. Yeah. This is the life that Princess Diana lived, always on television, always in public. I, too, admire the Truman Show to the point that after I saw it, I was eager to do this special show devoted to Jim Carrey. I was one of the few critics I've mentioned who liked him in his other risky film, The Cable Guy, and I appreciate the risk-taking here as well, daring well, us to follow a character whose life is a pain for him with every facet of his adventure. life as grist for the medium mill. I want to get away, see some of the world, explore. Okay. You want to be an explorer? This will pass. We all think like this now and then. In recent years, such major comic talents as Richard Pryor and Eddie Murphy have been typically unwilling to submit to the visions of major directors, and their films have suffered as a result. Jim Carrey and Peter Weir are first-rate partners in realizing The Truman Show. They're both a little creatively mad. I think they are both a little mad, and of course, Peter Weir was able to work with a talent like Robin Williams in Dead Poets Society. Yes. Williams, like Kerry, with a bigger-than-life, over-the-top personality, and he was able to restrain that and focus it yes. in the same way that he does here with Kerry without losing the essence that makes Kerry so special as a performer. Yeah. Uh, again, these comic talents tend to shy away. They want to control. They're used to creating mm -hmm. their own jokes. Mm -hmm. They don't want to have a director get involved mm -hmm. with them. Kerry's mm -hmm. smart enough to turn himself over and is better because of it. Coming up next, a closer look at Jim Carrey's wide-ranging movie career. Was that over the top? I can never tell. <laughs> Welcome back to our special show called Jim Carrey Class Clown, a serious half-hour critical look at the biggest comedy star in the movies today. Let's recap his pictures. And they're all hits. In Ace Ventura Pet Detective, Carrey simply thumbed his nose and other body parts at the establishment characters in the film, as well as conventional comedy itself. He would do or say anything to get a laugh in the intentionally ridiculous story of a jerk going undercover to recapture the Miami Dolphin football team's stolen mascot. 351! 351! Rover, sit! Hush, hush! He seems to have some difficulty letting go of the game. Has he had a long history of mental illness? Later that year, in the very funny Dumb and Dumber, I think Carrie played dumber to Jeff Daniels' dumb, in the story of two dim friends who drive cross-country with, unknown to them, a briefcase full of ransom money. What are we gonna do? I got an idea. Go faster! In The Mask, the same year, Carrie jumped off the screen as a human special effect, playing a mild-mannered bank teller who comes alive as a superhero whenever he dons a special mask. Okay. In Batman Forever, Carrie was the one entertaining element, going full tilt, as in the mask, playing the Riddler. Riddle me this, riddle me that. Who's afraid of the big black bat? In the sequel, Ace Ventura, When Nature Calls, Carrie returned to his gross-out school of comedy. This is my least favorite of the characters he plays. Do I have something in my teeth? In 1996, flush with success, Jim Carrey took a risk, bless him, playing a darkly comic character in The Cable Guy as a man who essentially reinvented himself by spending his whole life sitting too close to a TV set. What's your real name? It's Larry Tate, but that's not what's important right now. We have to get you out of here. I was watching court TV. I think I saw the loophole in your case. I'm going to talk to the judge about a writ of habeas corpus. And Carrie found another good script with his next picture, Liar Liar, displaying perfect verbal comic timing, playing an attorney and workaholic dad who, as a punishment, is forced to tell the truth for 24 consecutive hours. Judge Stevens, I badly, badly need a continuance. Ill? Am I ill? That is the perfect question for you to ask. Please lie on for me. I remember when you bought me this antique silver frame from Tiffany's. Tiffany's. Gosh, I'll set 50 mark down from 10. That's funny stuff. In all of those films, we got a chance to see Kerry refine his persona across a range of different projects, giving him the opportunity to invent some of the most memorable comic characters in recent movie history. Oh, yeah, I agree. And uh, I think if I had to pick a favorite of those, it would probably be Liar Liar, which is mm. just absolutely flat-out 
totally across the board unrestrained effort and energy on his part. Uh, it's uh, it's a time. movie that you can't help yeah. uh, but enjoy because he places himself in this wonderful dilemma of trying to tell, he can't get his jaw to work when he's trying to tell a lie. Yeah, the precision is, uh, is perfect. Coming up next, where did Jim Carrey come from? A survey of his early career, including some landmark TV. Mr. Spock, my friend, we've got to do something. <laughs> Marshal Bill, I did. I walked home just thinking, well, I've, I've brought evil into the world and I'm going to, you know, suffer for it. Oh, my gosh! I hope he's okay! Never better! And that's Jim Carrey as Fire Marshal Bill, his best-known character from In Living Color. And that, of course, was the often brilliant weekly comedy series created by Keenan Ivory Wayans that starred most of the talented Wayans family and featured Jim Carrey as the all-purpose white guy. Carrey had been working as a stand-up comedian for 13 years before that and had acted in a handful of supporting movie roles, but it was on In Living Color that he first began to find an audience for his unique blend of physical humor and exploding personality. You know, his body language has always reminded me of cartoon characters, and he says that when he was growing up, the cartoons on television were the first and enduring influence on his comic persona. I think in cartoons, honestly. It's like I, I used to walk down the street when I was a kid and see that Coyote Acme blueprint. You know, I'd see a pile of garbage, you know, and, and, uh, and I'd see the little, you know, uh, the little dots going over it and uh, the little line, and I'd somehow figure out whether, whether or not I could leap over it. Maybe that makes it appropriate that his first TV series in 1984 was The Duck Factory, about working in an animation studio. Have you seen the cue sheets for the music? Yeah, I put them back in your room. His first role on the big screen was a bit part in a Richard Lester film, Finders Keepers, in 1984. I don't want to go to Venezuela. You should have thought of that when you deserted. I wouldn't have deserted if you'd have kept me out of the draft. What draft? You enlisted! Oh, yeah. He played other small roles for big directors in the years that followed. Here he is in 1986 as Walter, a classmate in Francis Ford Coppola's Peggy Sue Got Married. Peggy Sue and Mr. Square Root. He's a nice guy. He's writing a book. A book? Excuse me for a second. <laughs> he got a better role as a rock star in the fifth Dirty Harry movie, The Deadpool. Brilliant. Won't be original or creative, but at least the audience will know I froze my ass off. Now, what the hell is that supposed to mean? It means a director with talent would have the guts to shoot something original instead of ripping off old movies like The Exorcist. And in Earth Girls Are Easy, his emerging screen personality could be sampled as he joined Jeff Goldblum and Damon Wayans as aliens visiting Earth. Wow. Which one is that? This lock. We are human now. When I watch those early scenes, one thing occurs to me above anything else. Unless an actor has a unique talent and finds the right outlet for it, he can keep on grinding out forgettable supporting roles forever. Those films are how Jim Carrey spent the 80s. In the 90s, he has grossed more than a billion dollars. The whole key was in living color, which inspired producer James Robinson and director Tom Shadyak to set free the comic personality that was hiding inside all those other roles. And what they wanted, and what audiences have wanted, and Carrie has delivered, is a series of, you know, cartoon characters. Mm -hmm. Elastic men, if you will, that don't play by normal physical rules. In any of his actions, he is not a normal human being. And that is what is so appealing. He's really out there. You know, when I was a kid, uh, my favorite comic book was Plastic Man. And I think he could play oh, Plastic Man, the yes. guy that could stretch in himself yes. into any shape at all. Yes. But on the other hand, one thing that Carrie is up against is the fact that they do want him to do the same thing, more or less, every time. And that's both a freedom and a limitation. I'm glad that in the Truman Show, he tries yes. and succeeds in stretching a little He bit. knows what he's doing. He does have control of his career. When we come back, we'll pin down exactly what it is we like about America's most popular funny man. Continuing our special show on Jim Carrey, let me state straight out why I think he's worthy of this show. With the range of material he's created, 
Kerry has shown that he has more than just manic energy going for him. He's not content with just fat balls and slapstick. He's also drawn to films with ideas, like The Cable Guy, about a man who is a prisoner of his own fantasy. One, two, three! When the truth is found to be light. And The Truman Show, about a man who is prisoner of other people's fantasies. Maybe I'm being set up for something. You ever think about that, Marlon? Like your whole life has been building towards something? Mm, no. When you were hauling chickens in the summer for Kaiser, what was the furthest you ever got off the island? Went all over. Never found a place like this, though. Look at that sunset, Truman. It's perfect. Now, comparing Jim Carrey to other major heavyweight comic talents like Robin Williams or Eddie Murphy, I'm trying to think of an idea in a recent Robin Williams or Eddie Murphy comedy. Sorry, can't come up with one. By comparison with those actors, Jim Carrey is a rare breed, a true class clown, a clown with class. Well, I think uh, Murphy has a certain amount of ideas in The Nutty Professor, but I know what you're talking about when you say that Carrey in The Truman so Show has really one. made the, I think he's made the best of show here in terms of that little competition. This is a movie that kind of extends him beyond the range of anywhere he'd gone before. and. Uh, you're right about that. Okay, what do I like most about Jim Carrey? The first thing would be the choreography of his physical performances. He doesn't simply make faces and run around on the screen. He knows how his body works and looks, and as we discussed, he's inspired by cartoon animation. Look at this scene from Liar Liar, where he desperately wants to tell a lie, but unknowingly is the victim of his child's wish that he tell only the truth for 24 hours, which is professionally dangerous for a lawyer. <laughs> The thing I admire about Jim Carrey is his superb timing, the way he understands how physical movement plays and unfolds on a movie screen. Here's a scene from Batman Forever where the Riddler meets another master criminal, Two-Face, played by Tommy Lee Jones. Look at the measured and calculated way Carrey uses body language to punctuate his snappy lines. Very few people are both a summer and a winter, but you pull it off nicely. What's the point, big boy? Has anybody ever told you you have a serious impulse control problem? When I asked him what were the big influences on his work, I expected him to mention somebody like Groucho Marx or Jerry Lewis, sure. and he mentioned the British painter Francis Bacon, wow. who specializes in contorted and twisted and distorted representations of the human body. As I thought about that, I said, yes, Francis Bacon would have been comfortable with his scene from the Ace Ventura movie where he enters the scene through the rear orifice of a hippopotamus. That could be a Francis Bacon well, painting. <laughs> there is a major howl, a primal howl yes. in Bacon's work, and I guess there is one in Carrie's too. Although the howl in Carrie <laughs> is a howl of laughter. <laughs> Coming up, our career advice to Carrie on what to do or not to do next in his amazing career. On this final segment of our special program about Jim Carrey, Gene and I both plan to give him some career advice. And it's a good thing, of course, that he didn't take the implicit advice of our first Ace Ventura review and retire right there on the spot. My advice at this point would be pretty simple. Stay away from the temptation to do slice-of-life realism because there are a lot of other actors who can do that, and I don't think it fits your particular gift. Don't feel you have to prove something by casting yourself against type. I think you have two real strengths. One is in broad physical comedy, but you don't need me to tell you that, but the other one is in the realms of fantasy or reality-based fantasy like The Truman Show. When I think of roles you could have played, I think of some of the crazier Robin Williams and Tom Hanks roles. Carey, Jim Carey, you project a kind of conspiratorial magic that would have worked in films like Jumanji or Joe versus the Volcano. So stay on the side of the fanciful and you'll do just fine. My advice for Jim Carey, you're doing great without me taking risks. All I can humbly suggest, and I am a little bit humbled, since that first review of the Ace Ventura pictures. Although, in the review, to be fair to both of us, we did say the guy has potential. And I would still vote thumbs down on the first movie. Oh, I don't too. think it was a successful film, but I think at least, at least we can claim that we did say on that same review that there was a talented guy up there on the yeah. screen and he was working hard and that his career might go somewhere, and boy, it sure has. And one of the things I liked about Carrie 
is that after all the thumbs down that he has gotten over the years on the show, he's still willing to talk to us and about his career and be a little bit objective about the reviews, maybe because he has so much confidence in his own talent. I mean, maybe the essence of what you like about me won't change, but there will be material that I'm going to go back to. I'm going to do more screwball comedy stuff, and that might not fit into your taste. And what he's talking about doing next, although whether it will be made or not is a good question, is the biography of the comedian Andy Kaufman. Ooh. And certainly, if you want to get inside a comic, it takes another comic to be able to understand how and, that would work. And another comic, Andy Kaufman, who really pushed the limits as well as Jim Carrey has. So I'm excited about that project. Me too. Remember, you can hear our reviews of all the new movies at our website, siskel-ebert.com. That's it for this special show, and next week we'll be back with another special show, a look at some great American movies. We're calling the show Hail, Hail, Black and White. That's next week, and until then, the balcony is closed. <laughs>